Okay, last Greek art lecture. All you'll have left is your uh, test review podcast. Uh, and this slide, too, is review. Uh, you've seen the Diplian crater before, and you should recognize the geometric style. This is not, by the way, an example of black figure painting and hadn't been invented yet. Instead, this design was painted on. And since it was a funeral urn, and by the way, it was over three feet tall, so this is a very substantial piece, uh, it didn't need to survive repeated washings. So note again that the artist has left no empty space to tempt evil spirits. Uh, you've seen this one before as well. Uh, so with the Orientalizing period, uh, we do see our first examples of the innovative new black figure painting, which was invented by artists from the Greek city-state of Corinth. Uh, I trust you have already watched the excellent video about how these works were created. Just to recap, the black silhouettes were put down first, then details were incised with a sharp instrument. Highlights were added in purple and white before the vessel was fired in that complicated three-step process that was described in the podcast. The silhouetted figures turned black except where they'd been incised. The vases would then be polished with a stone to a bright sheen. By the way, I was curious about why the Greek vase painter didn't simply use paint on glazes. Uh, and the answer, it turns out, is that they couldn't get the kilns hot enough. Uh, so this was a brilliant technical workaround, if you will. So notice again here the triangular bodies and the human-animal combinations that are reminiscent of Near Eastern art. This is evidence that this is from that early orientalizing period. Okay, the Greeks had a lot of different uh, vase styles. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, and I don't actually think you need to know all of these, although I suppose it wouldn't hurt. But the biggies are the crater, which is C, uh, which was used for mixing wine and water. The amphora, which is D. Notice that it's taller and slimmer. It was a store and has higher handles. It was a storage vessel, uh, both for oil and for wine. Uh, and then the lekathos, which is B, the tall, slender one with the single handle, uh, was mostly used to hold oils, but it was also used as a funerary urn, and we'll see an example of that in just a few minutes. Okay, moving on. Uh, we're moving into the Archaic period, and the slides you haven't seen before, although these uh, figures are, of course, in your textbook. So this is a different kind of crater. Notice the higher handles and that they're shaped like those Ionian scrolls or volutes. So what technique does the painter use to tell a narrative in this face painting? Yep, we see registers again. Uh, and while there are still some geometric figures on this crater, it's devoted mostly to telling stories about Achilles from the Iliad and about Theseus, the legendary king of Athens, who was also the fellow who fought the Minotaur, you may recall. So here again, we see a centauromachy, uh, that well-known fight between the Lapiths and the centaurs that they foolishly invited to a wedding and even more foolishly offered wine. Uh, notice that the artist no longer fills in every bit of empty space, but he is still employing the composite type. So we see profile heads, frontal eyes, frontal torsos, torsos and profile legs and arms. Now you saw a really excellent video about this piece, and I won't try to repeat it. I do want you to be able to get to your PowerPoint presentations. Uh, the artist, Ezekias, was a master of black figure painting. By the way, he signed this piece as both the painter and the potter. Unlike the work we just saw, this is not divided into registers. It tells one central tale, and there's a lot of dramatic tension, which I think, again, was well described in the podcast. Note the extraordinarily detailed rendering of the cloaks and the careful composition that uses the spears to direct our eyes toward the action uh, and to emphasize Ajax's greater tension as he's losing this context. Again, I think this was well described. 
And now we make the transition to red figure vases, a technique that allowed painters to include more detail, uh, especially more expressive faces. This was a bilingual face, uh, vase. These were only made for a fairly brief period uh, that shows the same scene you just saw between Achilles and J Ajax using both the black figure and the red figure technique. So it's a really good example uh, to look at both of these. So what kind of vase is this? Notice it's taller and thinner, although I wouldn't call it real thin, but again, it's an amphora. Uh, the advantage of the red figure technique, where details were brushed in rather than in size, was the artist could use much more detail and could change the effect and the colors by varying the thickness of the glaze. So you could have, you, know, you could go from a deep black to even a fairly pale brown. It expanded the range of colors available to the artist. Uh, now you get a better sense of the artistic potential of the red figure technique. This is a famous red figure vase painter, and I'm sorry I keep hitting uh, my command by mistake. Uh, so this is depicting Heracles wrestling Antaeus. Antaeus was a giant who derived his power from his physical contact with the earth. So in order to defeat him, Heracles had to lift him up so that this contact was broken. Uh, note that you see much more expressive faces, especially the giant who's actually shown grimacing with pain. Uh, again, you know, we're seeing some of this transition to more emotion, uh, more depiction of the physical body. Notice the way the artist was able to use the brush to delineate the muscles of the chest and the abdomen. Uh, Euphronius, the artist, also moves away from the composite representation of the human figure to much more realistic and optical style. So we see overlapping figures which give this, the painting volume a sense of three-dimensional space. So just as sculptors were gradually moving beyond the block of stone into space, uh, so the painters are creating an illusion of space on the two-dimensional surface. So we kind of see parallel developments. Uh, now, this is a depiction of three drunken partiers, and it also shows a continued development of the optical style of painting, in particular the technique of foreshortening uh, as an effort to show the, the basically the figure's uh, receding into space. Now, your textbook defines foreshortening as, and I quote, the use of perspective to represent in art the apparent visual contraction that is disappearing of an ob object that extends back in space at an angle to the perpendicular plane of sight, clear as mud, right? But you notice the angled figures, and that angle does give an impression of the figure moving away from us, and the body is shown, you know, again, the, the nearer parts, in this case, those very prominent buttocks, are larger because they're closer to us. So we are seeing a use of perspective, and that's what that definition is talking about. Uh, again, showing the figure from this new angle represents an artistic advancement and more evidence that the ever-mathematical Greeks were learning the rules of perspective that would be rediscovered in the Renaissance. Uh, this face painting also shows foreshortening with its three-quarter view, but it's also notable for depicting a female nude. The subject is a servant girl. You can tell by the way she's carrying towels and a you know, container of water. A highborn woman would not be shown nude, at least in this period. And now we move into the classical period. Uh, we have historical accounts that there were mural paintings on wood in this period. In fact, you know, famous museums filled with these paintings. Unfortunately, uh, they were made on wood and they have not survived. So the closest we can come are these polychrome, you've seen that uh, term before, or multicolor vases, which are using the white ground painting technique. Now this is a variation on the red figure technique. The artist would cover the pot with a slip of very fine white clay and then apply black glaze to outline the figure. So you're still using the black glaze essentially as a painting device. The other colors were added after firing. Now, the Greeks hadn't figured out how to create these colors in a way that withstood the heat of the kiln, and of course that also meant uh, that those colors were unlikely to withstand repeated washing. So this le lekathos was in fact a funerary urn. Uh, it would not need to withstand repeated washings, which so the paint would survive. 
the painting here shows a warrior saying farewell to his wife before he heads into battle. It's a little hard to see here, but the artist has actually attempted to paint an eye in profile, not a frontal eye. Uh, and he also uses foreshortening to create a spence, sense of space or volume. So we continue to see technical advancement. There you see the foreshortening. Uh, these are not in your book, but here are just a couple of other examples of this uh, white ground technique, which again dates from the classical period. Uh, this is interesting because it gives a better sense of the multiple use of color. The colors, for the most part, haven't survived very well. Uh, what's intriguing here is that the artist has abandoned the common ground line uh, and is instead portraying the story on ta staggered tiers. And this, this parallels the move away from strict frontality in classical Greek sculpture. This is a somewhat later work. Another interesting feature of this crater is it had, depicts landscape. Uh, those are kind of odd-looking trees. They remind me a little bit of the trees in Charlie Brown's Christmas special, if you all have seen that. Uh, nevertheless, it is an introduction of landscape. Uh, Niobe, by the way, was a mortal woman who was stupid enough to brag to Leto, the mother of Apollos and Artemis, that she had 12 children and Leto only had two. And those two, of course, being Apollo and Artemis, uh, big deal gods. And Leto, who's teed off at this, sends her kids to massacre the other woman's dozen children. Charming tale. Uh, note that this artist even renders a face in three-quarters profile. Notice again, too, uh, the depiction of the musculature and the body, the Greek fascination with the beautiful human body. And again, you see the three-quarter profile and the foreshortening. And by the way, that was noticeable because, notable because that had a foreshortened face, three-quarter profile. Uh, this white ground painting was actually found on a small Etruscan tomb in southern Italy, uh, but the textbook identifies it as a Greek painting. I know that the trees are similar to the ones in the crater we just saw. And this finishes up Greek art. Uh, you will have a podcast review, as I mentioned, that'll be available on Moodle. We're not going to show it in class, but I strongly recommend that you watch. Next comes your test, and then on to Rome.